Welcome back to the show. I have something and someone really special for you today. I have the CEO of Sendhound, Tim Vogel himself. Tim and I have been friends and he's also been a client of Scale with Psychology. We've worked together for over a year now. That's right. I think. Yeah. And it's such a pleasure and such an honor to have you on this inaugural episode of Scale with Psychology, fresh off the rebrand. Yeah. And let me just yeah. So I'm, 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 welcome I'm, to the show. Yeah, thank you so much, and I'm honored to be here. This is a lot of fun, and uh, yeah, really, really looking forward to this conversation. We've had such epic conversations. I think this one is going to be one for the record books. And what I'm really excited about is the wisdom and the nuggets that you're going to share from your experience in the trenches building Sandhound. So let's start by just talking about Sandhound. Tell us a little bit about the company and what you guys are up to. Yeah, so I kind of one of the first reactions I get is, what is Scenthound? And so Scent is actually an acronym. It stands for skin, coat, ears, nails, and teeth, which are the five core areas that all dogs need preventive routine maintenance around. So we're a dog wellness business. And we've actually set our system up so that if you've got a dog, you can be a great dog parent by getting a membership with Scenthound and bringing them at least monthly to our centers where we do all the preventive routine maintenance your dog needs to keep them happy and healthy and, get, and keep them on the path to wellness. So this is a system to really ensure health, wellness, well-being of dogs. Exactly right. So when you think about being a dog parent, most people think when they first get a dog, like, uh-oh, what am I going to feed this dog? And how do I make sure they don't poop in my house? And that's about as far as it goes. So we really want to make it so it's really accessible for dog parents to get the basic routine care they need for their dogs. Because all dog parents, at the end of the day, want to be a great dog parent. They just don't know what it means to be a great dog parent. So we set up a business that's, number one, educational, but also accessible, easy, and, and fits into their lifestyle so that they can bring their dog in when they go grocery shopping or when they go do their workout or when they go to the dry cleaning drop off their dog, and in pretty fast fashion, kind of 30 minutes or so, get the basic routine maintenance their dog needs to keep them healthy. And the benefit is the dog could live longer, the vet bills are reduced, you're more likely to connect with your dog, and you're more likely to keep your dog, actually. So we work with Rescue League, so you're less likely to even surrender your dog because they're taken care of in a preventive routine way. And right now, Sandtown is nationwide? So we actually, and we can tell the story, but we really started as a grooming business and then over the years really started to create a deep learning about the industry and what it needed. And so evolving and testing and then ultimately coming up with the Scenthound model, we had such success with it that we had, we had opened five of these things, ultimately six of them, had so much success that we decided that franchising was probably the best way to scale this, to help amplify our impact in the world and, and help people everywhere become great dog parents. Yeah, we're from California to New Jersey to Florida to Texas. We're all over the nation now. Beautiful. So let's begin at the beginning because that was a long time ago and yep. the business resembled nothing like what it is today. Yep. I believe you started out of, out of a van. Correct. I remember once when I was working in another company and, and a friend owned it, he said, you never end with what you start with. And, he, and that's exactly the case here. So what we started with is not what we have today. But there was a tremendous amount of learning along that journey. Once upon a time, I was living in the Washington, D.C. area, married. We had a young child. And my wife convinced me to get a dog. And I resisted it, to be honest with you, because it just meant more responsibility. Once we got the dog, I absolutely fell in love. And I started geeking out about, this is such a cool thing. It feels, um, it feels different owning a dog. It was almost like... There was this human animal bond that was almost primordial. And so I started researching it and there's this co-evolution between humans and dogs. And I started really geeking out about that. And I just started to see that there was a huge opportunity for people to improve their lives through having a dog. And when I started looking at taking the entrepreneurial leap, I looked at franchises, I looked at all kinds of different business models, and I ultimately kept coming back to the pet space. And I thought working with dogs would be really cool. This is a really cool space. And so... Having been in industries that understood kind of intelligent routing and pre-unit economics and stuff, I landed on mobile grooming. I thought at-home services are really taking off. Dog ownership's growing. I think it was like a $42 billion industry at the time. And so we took a huge leap and we actually did this life by design. And we said, okay, if we're going we're gonna to start this new journey, 
where would be an ideal place to live? What are all the features you want in that kind of life? And so we did this whole life by design. We ended up moving to South Florida to a community we're still in and we love, place where we raised our kids. And we started a mobile grooming business. And that really started with me going to grooming school and understanding what grooming looked like, buying a truck, hiring my first groomer. And that's how it all started. So it was me in grooming school with my first truck and then my first groomer. And then we grew that over the next six months to four vans with a handful of groomers. And that's when the journey really began because what I had built in that six months and what I learned in that six months wasn't, didn't look anything like what I expected. And there was a whole host of problems around scalability, a whole host of challenges that I didn't expect. And that was an oh shit moment. Like, oh, what have I done? I moved my family. I started this business and this isn't what I thought it was. And that's what started this kind of long journey that we've been on. How long ago was that? So that was 2005 when we moved to South Florida. It was mid 2005. And I think we serviced our first customer in July, 2005. Wow. So that's almost two decades ago. Yeah. And so tell us a little bit about that gap between expectation and reality, because this is something that pretty much every entrepreneur faces, regardless of the business. But it sounds like it, it was quite a, a reality check. Yeah, I'd gone through the exercise of a business plan and all the different aspects of the business. And I made a lot of assumptions in that process, which are you have to in some cases. But I looked around and I said, there's a mobile grooming franchise out there. So this is obviously a successful model that, that, that is easy to replicate and people have figured out how to scale it. And that was one of my first four assumptions because one of the biggest challenges with growing the mobile grooming business was the groomer. So finding a groomer actually was really challenging. Finding a good groomer was even more challenging than finding a groomer that could drive a van safely, competently, that could also interact with a customer in a great customer service kind of way. All of a sudden you start adding up all of those things that they needed to be, that pool of people shrank to zero. And so scaling it without a, a staff to be able to deliver the service became one of the biggest barriers. And so that was my first big challenge that I faced. And so that was my first moment. We bought four vans. I had a couple of groomers, but all of a sudden they started turning over. They couldn't drive a van. They weren't good with customers. They may not have been a good groomer to begin with. And so I had to solve the people problem. And that was the first one that I really dug in on. And how'd you do that? Yeah, the grooming school I went to, I went back to them and I said, do you have any students that would be, are interested in mobile grooming? And by and large, there wasn't because it just, there might've been one, but it had to certain, everything was, had to line up perfectly. So instead, what I did is I said, look, I'll find the student for you. Let me go hire someone that has the right attitude that I know is good with customer service, that I can trust driving the van that was coachable is one of those key skills that I was looking for. And then I'm actually going to pay for them to go to your school. I want them in your school four days a week. They're going to be in the van with me or one of our, one of our trimmers one day a week. And they're going to learn our business while they're learning to be a groomer. And then when they graduate, I'm actually going to take part of their commission. That's 5% of their commission. And over a year, let them earn out the tuition. So they would pay back the tuition over time. So I would help someone develop a trade that could have forever, guarantee them work while they were doing it, have them learn our business. And that's how we ultimately started to grow the mobile business is one hire at a time that I put in school and then they, and I paid their tuition and then they did an earn out over time. And after I would say a, a year and a half, two years, we had a pretty stable business with good groomers, with a regular schedule that we were out and servicing the community. And that was a pretty good lifestyle business. The problem was, my vision was to create something national, to do some, to make a difference, to build something scalable. And so having solved that problem, I still looked up and I said, okay, this is as far as this is going to go. I could maybe get this thing to 10 vans if I'm really killing it. There, there was a company that had gotten it to 20 some doing that, but they actually built their own grooming school. And so when I was at four vans, that was the next hurdle I had to face is, okay, do I replicate what someone else did there, build a grooming school? Then I'm really in the grooming school business with a, a mobile grooming component, or is there another way? And so that was the next crux I faced. Don't leave us hanging, keep going. <laughs> and just to be clear, there was no pre-existing successful model. You were basically innovating both at the business model level and at the business level. 
Yeah, there there was a whole bunch of like mole groomers out there, and it wasn't wildly popular, but there was a bunch of them out there, and they were mostly a groomer who didn't want to work in a grooming shop who went and bought their own van. There was one, maybe two companies nationally at that time that had built a grooming school and then used that to build their mobile grooming business. And they actually built a mobile grooming van business where they actually manufactured the vans. And so they had that trifecta there, but that's not the business I wanted to be in. In addition to kind of those two years getting to know the pet industry better, I started to look around and understood that the industry was like wildly fractured. Like it was all mom and pops, even in the grooming, the salon style grooming places, the brick and mortar places. And so I said, there's really Petco and PetSmart were really the only things that were doing grooming at scale. And the way I think of Petco and PetSmart is really they're a grocery store for pet products and they're adding services in to get you to come in and buy their products, right? So almost think of like our local grocery stores, Publix down here. It's almost buying coffee from Publix versus being like a Starbucks where you're specialized in coffee. So that's what the flavor was out there. So as I started to really understand what the landscape looked like, I recognized there was a massive opportunity to create a recognizable, trusted brand in the grooming space. And so if I could figure out how to crack that nut, I knew there was a massive opportunity. And so I was here with these four little vans running this mobile grooming business, and it was supporting my family, but it isn't where I wanted to go. And ultimately, it's not the lifestyle I wanted either because it would support my family, but it was just supporting my family. It wasn't a life of abundance in any way. And so I got stuck. And that's where I was there for another year or so, like thinking through, do I just do the grooming school? And that's when I started reaching out to communities to figure out, to help myself grow. And that's when I found the EO organization. And EO was actually a tremendous help to me to be around other entrepreneurs who were stuck in trying to solve problems. And it gave me a format and a forum in order to think through the processes and think through the opportunity. And that's when the next big pivot came where I said, look, it's all about the technician. The technician is the hardest thing. We need to make them, but I can't rely on this grooming school and the payment and all that stuff. So we opened, we decided to open a brick and mortar shop. So a brick and mortar grooming business. And what we did is we went to one of the larger grooming schools in the nation. We bought their curriculum. And we said, okay, we're going to become a grooming shop that's a grooming school, but it's not going to be advertised as a grooming school. It's not going to be set up like a grooming school. It's just, we're going to hire the people we like, and we're going to actually change the grooming process a little bit. So they start as bathers, just doing the bathing. And then we add on competency slowly. So nail trimming, ear cleaning, then they start doing blow drying and brush outs, and then starting to learn how to care for the dog and handle them. And then ultimately doing the rough cuts and then learning the trimming. And so we created this whole career path inside these salons that we had that would make groomers. And that was pretty successful. So it took us about six months to make a groomer. It took us about a year to make a really good one. And then if we lost a mobile groomer, we had some groomers in the stable that I could put back out in the mobile grooming business and let that run. And we can continue to build groomers in the retail center. And we had enough success with that, that we actually opened up our second location. So then we opened up just down the road, a couple of miles or second location. And in that place, we were building groomers. It was during that time though, that I, I started realizing a couple of things. One is we were, we had turnover just like any other business, but the groomers that we spent a year making, we started seeing that they were getting their training, learning the business, and then going off and commanding a higher percentage from a vet because they'd actually do the business at a loss or they'd start their own business. And they and so we were making technicians that ultimately didn't stay with us or it took us so long, we, didn't, we couldn't grow enough to actually grow our business rapidly. It was still too slow of a process. And so that's when we got stuck again and there was another pivot moment there. So we started mobile, solved a handful of problems in mobile, ultimately got stuck, created a retail location, solved a bunch more problems and created a slightly more scalable business, a more profitable business because of the career path, but it still wasn't what I wanted to achieve. At that point, we had been in the business, gosh, seven, eight years now. And so we had a couple locations. We had our fleet of mobile trucks. Again, it was a healthy business. It was making us more money than just the mobile was making us, but it wasn't ultimately where we wanted to be. And so that was another kind of point where I had to really reflect on 
what business are we in? Why are we in this business? What is the opportunity here? And one of the ahas I had is we were really trying to scale artistry. And so we sent all of our groomers to the national grooming competitions to get nationally certified master license. And we were, and I, and this is when I was an EO, I learned about this kind of red ocean, blue ocean strategy. And we were what I would consider in a red ocean where we were competing with all the other grooming shops on the level of artistry our groomers could give. So who gave the best haircut? And so I was like, God, is haircutting really? Cause I think we've always been about grooming has been about health in our mind, but we're really, fo we're really focused on the artistry. And so then I started to dig into that a little bit as what does health look like? And how do you scale artistry? And those were two big problems I was trying to solve. The first problem around the artistry part, when I looked at the landscape of dogs, if you look at the top 10 breeds, still today, you look at the top 10 breeds of dogs owned in the US, only one of the top 10 breeds owned, owned in this country needs a haircut, which means nine of those 10 dogs don't actually need a haircut. And I was thinking about that, like those dogs actually aren't coming in for grooming, but all dogs need care. So first of all, we are missing a huge portion of the population, the blue ocean part of that. And then secondly, I started looking at the haircut. Like, why do we give these haircuts? And I was going to those grooming competitions and I was going to the seminars about grooming. And you know, I started to realize that almost all haircuts were for two things. One was functional. So to make the dog's job easier, to tie into their dog's job, or to make the dog look like their breed standard, which means they would be good at their job. Are they built in the right way to do their job correctly? So a perfect example is the standard poodle. Its haircut is actually a functional haircut. It looks like this couture fancy thing, but it's actually hair left at the places to keep the dog warm when it gets into the winter lake to retrieve the duck. So you cut all the hair away except for on the ankles. That's a pom-pom. That's hair keeping the ankle warm when it goes into the frigid water. It's got that top knot on the head. It keeps the brain warm. It's got it on the chest to keep the heart and lungs warm. And so the hunter clipped all the unnecessary hair away so the dog could swim further in the frigid lake to pick up the duck without being weighed down as much, but also protecting their vital organs and joints while they did that swim. I'll tell you, I don't think there's a standard poodle that's come into any of our centers that's jumping into a frigid lake to retrieve a duck. These are all pets. And so I started thinking about, I don't think people really care about that. They've just been educated. That's what their dog should get. And so that was the other big innovation is let's just give one haircut, not the hundred some plus standard breed standards that are out there. And we can significantly reduce our training and time to make a trimmer. And so we tested that model in addition to being a model about health and wellness. And that was where the idea of scent hunt was born. And so it was 2015 that we opened our very first scent hunt location. And we did two things. We actually got rid of haircuts. We didn't do them at all. And then number two, we said scent to skin coat, ears, nails, teeth. Let's see if we can just serve that 90%. And that did pretty well. Now, it, the marketplace wasn't quite ready for it. And that's when we decided the haircut, let's add in a simple haircut, one length all over. We can train people quicker. And that's how Senhan was born. And those were two of the big innovations that happened in that period. So I want to call out a couple of things for the entrepreneurs listening, because there's a few nuggets of wisdom in there. The first one is at each break point in the business, you got stuck and you almost had to go back to the drawing board and reconceptualize the business. And you went from just taking on a model that you saw working on, on, on some level, and then you reached the ceiling with the vans and then you went brick and mortar and you found these constraints. The main constraint was having the right technicians who were trained enough and who had representation in terms of those skill sets, people skills, and so on. And so you basically solved that constraint. And every time the constraint moved, you moved on to that constraint to try and solve it. And so you really had to go back to the drawing board and rethink and reconceptualize the business at each of those stages. Yeah. I think another really important part of this is I love this quote, answers are easy, questions are hard. Like you can Google anything if you ask the right question, right? And that was a big part of my learning curve is I was always looking for someone to tell me what to do. I was like, show me the way, tell me how. And it wasn't until I really paused and asked the right question that I was able to then identify better solutions. And so why do they have that haircut? It hasn't occurred to a lot of people in the industry, obviously, because no one's doing what we're doing right now. So asking that question and really evaluating 
kind of the reasons that people do it then opened up a new opportunity for me. Or, you know, why aren't all dogs getting grooming? Is grooming about haircuts? Which it was. It's really about styling. It should be about health because there's a ton of health benefits that come from grooming. Grooming is actually about a healthy routine practice. So why isn't there something for routine preventive maintenance out there? So asking that question and then really, really looking at what the marketplace had allowed me to open up all kinds of new pathways and possibilities, but I had to first get good at asking the right questions. And really overcoming the inertia or the momentum in the marketplace that just said, this is how it is. And getting over the fact that, hey, I want someone to tell me what to do. Show me a model that's, that I can replicate. Entrepreneurial, you, you have to be able to ask, you, you have to be able to, first of all, believe in yourself enough to say that maybe there's a new path and then also get good at really thinking about what are the right questions to ask. Was that hard to let go of the certainty of the well-trodden path of this is how it's done and go into the unknown of what it sounded like was a process of using first principles to break down that problem and industry and service and really ask if all those assumptions and all the reasoning by analogy that the industry was doing de facto actually made sense. Yeah, this is the part of every entrepreneurial podcast you hear where I just figured this out. And I think, I, th I think it tends to gloss over like the actual emotional hardship and the hand wringing and the worry and all that stuff that goes into the stuck phase that happens. So that stuck phase have at least had, had to happen for me. And it, and in that stuck phase, it's like, should I just go get a job? What am I doing here? Can I sell this thing? All of those other iterations that happen before you then can actually pause, dig deep and look in a different direction. And so that's a really challenging place to be. And it actually requires an evolution of the individual. And there were several evolutions that happened for me along the way. One of the first big evolutions was... I got into business to make more money and to have, I wanted to make money. That was the thing. And I didn't want someone telling me what to do. So those were like, I wanted to have that agency. As you get into this and you're like, okay, that's only going to get me so far. Mm -hmm. And part of the entrepreneur's organization that I was part of asked me to, started allowing me the space to ask other questions of, okay, so what does more money do for you? What is it that you want to really contribute in this world? Do you want to be a part of a business that actually gets you excited every day to get up? I like dogs, but I was doing it to make money. And so that was the, Another big part of that, that dovetailed that evolution, which is, okay, for the sake of what, for the sake of why are you showing up every day? And like, why don't you do something that makes you excited about showing up every day? You need that juice, that energy to get you up every day, which needs to be tied to something that actually has meaning for you. And so I was able to start asking those questions because I started asking myself the other question, which is for the sake of why am I here? What do I want to achieve with this? What is it that I want to be proud of 10 years from now, 20 years from now? And so one of the things that I had to really evolve in is really understanding why I cared about dogs and dogs' health. And I like thought of myself as a big dog guy. I like big dogs, but I don't like small dogs. Like, like how could you really care about all dogs if mm. the, you're a big dog guy? And so as I started to create, get greater and greater visibility to all dogs out there and really started to connecting with them and really understanding the value of a dog and that co-evolution between human and dog, something changed in me. And I started to ask those questions of how can I make the dog's life better? And that was the first one. Like most parent dog parents are not great dog parents just because they don't know, but they want to be great dog parents. And if they knew a little bit more, then maybe that dog would have a better, healthier life. And that was stage one. So really connecting with being a dog person, like an all dog kind of people. And then the second evolution that came out of that, which my dog brings love into our home all the day, every day and seeing my kids interact with the dog and seeing the dogs and other people's families be the center of their family and really bring an energy into their homes and watching a dog support an owner who's upset, read their emotions and stuff. And that's the other part of the evolution is like, we're making people's lives better. And you could see it. Like we were actually doing preventive things to help dogs live happier, healthier, but you could see the dog parent, once they knew what it meant to be a good dog parent, all of a sudden was connecting with that dog in a better way and they were happier and healthier. And all the science, as I started digging into the science, all the science proves it. If you have a dog in your life, on average, you have lower blood pressure. 
Mm. If you have a dog in your life, on average, you live longer. Harvard study came out a couple of years ago that says, when you have heart surgery, if you have a dog in your home, you recover 33% faster. And even thinking about this pandemic, there's been an explosion in dog ownership. Dogs are being used to help people manage anxiety and loneliness. So dogs are a really powerful tool in our lives. So having someone empathetically connected to the dogs really making a human's life better. And so when I started getting to, oh, this is meaningful to me, right? Oh, I just wanted to do a mobile and I wanted to have, there was ego in that and I wanted a bigger business and this wasn't working and this wasn't making me enough money. That was the beginning of it. But then there was an evolution of me, like, why am I doing this? And what's meaningful behind this? And it was when I started really connecting to that meaningfulness, that's where ideas started to occur to me. That's where I started to attract better people around us that really had the same kind of mission as us. And then we started to really formalize that and really get clear on what is our North Star? We remove barriers so people can love and connect with their dogs every day. What's our mission to keep dogs clean and healthy in a safe, loving environment with a knowledgeable team? What are our core values? And going through our core values of bring love, make a difference, seek growth, those things. So these are the things that started to really bring it together. And then all of a sudden started to create a new energy in me about going forward and really thinking about this business and thinking about this journey in a completely different way. It really sounds like you got through each of those points of stuckness in the business with an innovation in your thinking. Yes. And it was an innovation, psychological innovation that allowed you to break through that plateau and redefine the business in, in some way to get to this next stage. And then when you hit the ceiling on that stage, on that organization, that architecture, it took another innovation in your thinking to then refactor the business, refactor those assumptions, and then get to the next stage. Yeah, and at each of those pivot points was a support network, right? So the very first pivot point was the entrepreneur's organization being part of the accelerator program that ultimately EO. The next phase, I got a coach and I'm forever grateful, a gentleman named Govind, who helped me think about the why and really get in touch with kind of what is my value system and how do I create an organization that totally aligns with my value system and what's important to me? Even to today, where, where you and I have this relationship, which is yet another level of making the psychological shifts. And the way I really think of it is I'm seeing the business through, at, through this lens, at this direction right now. And having someone on the outside be able to say, look at it like that. And just that 1%, that one degree change opens up new possibilities, opens up new ways of looking at things, new ahas, and also having someone based on psychology challenge you, right? To say, okay, I understand you see it this way. Is there some other force at work here possibly? And for lack of a better term, call, call bullshit on the software you currently have running and challenge you to say, oh, let me pause and think about that a little bit. Maybe there's something underneath the surface that will, that will allow me greater capacity, allow me to open up new doors and new possibilities. Really well said. And I want to go back to another thing I pulled out of you sharing the evolution through those breakpoints, which was the way that you navigated and broke through that second one was by reducing the variables. So you were yeah. talking about the different kinds of haircuts and questioning those assumptions, going back to first principles. Do we really need to do this? Are these dogs actually on working in the way that the breed evolved or are they just pets? And therefore, can we do away with the complexity and very large number of variables? And it seemed like the way you broke through was actually cutting out those variables, cutting out that complexity. And this is something that I see most businesses really struggle with, where as the business grows, the more successful the business is, the, there's a proportional increase in complexity. And the increase in complexity ends up killing the growth rate of the business because at some point, the complexity basically reaches a local maximum and it cuts the business's ability to grow. And so I would love for you to A, talk about that pivot and also any other similar pivots 
or ways in which you've applied that same principle to reduce and cut out the complexity and the number of variables to actually allow the business to scale? Yeah, I think one thing that was my superpower in the beginning is over-engineering, right? I thought I was smarter. And so I would engineer something that was this very elegant, really not so elegant, wildly complex system, which then honestly never succeeded because I was the only one that could actually execute. It couldn't scale, right? And one of the mantras that there's, there's a famous quote, I won't try even to say who or how, because I'll get it wrong. But ultimately the mantra became trying to find the simplicity on the other side of complexity. And what does that really mean? What are the core elements? What are the things that, what's the 20% that gets us the 80%, the Pareto principle of the results, right? And so when we think about the haircuts, that's only a part of it, right? But let's, how do we simplify that? How do we make it one instead of a hundred sum? So simplicity on the other side of complexity. I think the other aspect of this is bias towards action. And you just got to try things. So we have another saying around here. It's make it bad, make it better. So just start, just do something. Like if you think, and then you just get it going and then learn from it and then simplify it and get to its essence, but you got to start. And that's another thing is I think as an entrepreneur, I spent a lot of time overthinking things. And the only thing that teaches is experience, in my opinion. So you have to have the experience. You got to bump into the corner. You got to get kicked in the face. You got to fall down. You got to have these things because that's actually where you, that's where the juice is. That's in that moment. And so getting better and better of that skill of just make it bad, make it better, just start. And if it's going to be awkward and it's going to feel weird and you're going to be searching the room in the dark, looking for the light switch, that's actually the place you want to be because the other side of that is where the answer is. And then that answer is still maybe a complex one. Like how do you then dig underneath the surface to find the essence of it, that 20% that re results in your 80%. And that was another thing I had to let, I let go on. I spent years running hundreds of experiments across our centers before I was ready to franchise. And it was actually, I was out talking with my buddies and he's just been just tangential and watching us grow this business. He said, it's time, dude. It's like, how many more tests do you need to run? Like, how much better are you going to make it? And it struck me. I was like, you're right. Like, let's bias towards action. It's, it's good enough. So you got to let go. That like 80% is good enough. You know what I mean? You got to let go and be able to move forward. And so bias towards action is another important one. It's really interesting how, as entrepreneurs, we give up certainty in so many ways. But we then try to recapture certainty in all these other ways that end up being essentially self-sabotaging. Yeah. And it's a, and it's a funny dynamic because you're searching for me, I was searching for freedom, right? But I still needed my certainty to feel safe. And so it's this paradox that you're going through and you have to, I, know, I don't know what the right word is, faith or whatever, but you have to believe there'll be an unfolding, you know, if you show up every day you show up in the right way, it will unfold in the right way for you. So along those lines, I have a weird question for you. Why didn't you give up? What caused you to be persistent and stick it through? Because there were periods there where it got pretty bleak, where it was really challenging, really hard. And many people would have given up. Yeah, I think... The entrepreneurial journey is tough, like tougher than people will tell you. Like it is exceptionally tough. And not every entrepreneurial journey is the same, but I'm pretty sure they're all pretty darn tough, right? And so the intention, the desire has to be straight from the beginning. I always knew that I wanted to create something or build something. I always had a clear vision of kind of the feeling that I wanted to achieve. And it's, and it's hard to put in words, but that never went away. Like that underlying desire has to be there, right? So that, that was, there was something deep in me, a deep desire in me wanting to create, wanting to control my own future, wanting to have my own agency and not to be a cog. And there's people working in companies that are a massive contributors and doing great things. So there's no, I'm making no judgment on that, but this is the path that I knew I needed to take. And so every time I felt totally down and out, I compared where I was and the hardship I was going through to what it would look like on the other side. And it felt like giving up on the other side. And so that was always the edge that kept me in the entrepreneurial journey is always having 
that one foot in desire. The thing that really started to accelerate the journey is when I started to let go of the holding on all of the problems, the needing of certainty, and I started really getting connected with gratitude every single day and not problem solving, but being grateful for what I had opened up a lot of momentum for me. And then being open and getting really connected to my why, like really my value system, then all of a sudden the energy started to flow into me and the grateful act exercise and the morning routines you have around protecting that mindset all of a sudden was a conduit of unlimited energy to then the hardship side or the failure side or the bumps in the road side, all of a sudden weren't the same at all. They were really, oh, great, a new challenge we have in front of us. Let's go solve that. Or, oh, that's interesting. I wonder what I missed there. Let's learn about that. Great, some new learning. And the entire hardship journey has completely flipped for me where the first kind of 10 years of this grind that I was in, that was really the desire at my kind of very soul level kept me going through. Ultimately, as I got more connected with the why and more connected to gratitude and more open to opportunity, all of that stuff started to wash away. But it took me a long, it took me 10 years of bumping my head against those walls to get to that place. That's something worth noting in this age of instant gratification. Yeah. Where particularly in the online entrepreneurship space, people want to hit six, multiple six figures in yeah. six weeks. And by following the six steps, it sometimes takes a little more time than that. Yeah. It takes a little more patience than that. I would argue that's by and large complete myth, at least in my experience and being in an entrepreneurial community, I've seen, and I coach through EO, dozens and dozens of entrepreneurs that I've never seen that happen. Now we read news stories, but even the news stories, it's a glorification of the reality of what's really happening there. And so I think that's a disservice we do to entrepreneurs. I think it's a disservice we do to people on this journey because, because then you feel like, why am I failing? You feel alone in that journey. And ultimately it can create a lot of damage. I think that worthwhile distinction there is there are people who can essentially run a model that's been established where there's a high degree of certainty and it's possible to get some wins, make some sales and hit those big financial milestones relatively faster. But the entrepreneurs like you, for example, who are essentially pioneering something that hasn't been done before, there's so much uncertainty that needs to be accounted for that it takes a much longer time. But the upside is that when you are willing to put a couple of decades into solving the same problem, you learn a lot and you become really good and you develop such a mastery of that domain, of that problem set, of that avatar, even if that avatar is a dog, that it allows for a breakthrough insight that becomes the seed of nine or 10 or 11 figure business. Whereas those predictable, high certainty, step-by-step -step model, start a marketing agency or start a design agency where, you know, it's pretty laid out and there is very little uncertainty. There's a natural cap because you can't really exceed that. But to build a disruptive world-changing business, it requires a breakthrough insight and those breakthrough insights can only be earned. They can't be bought. Yeah, I think you're really talking entrepreneurialism as I'm defining it. You know, there's a 10, there's at least a 10 year product market fit stage. Now, can you shorten that cycle? Sure. But I don't know how, by how much, because you really do need a deep learning of the needs and obviously technology cycling things faster and faster, but you still have to put in your 10,000 hours. I don't care who you are. You've, if you want to be a master of something, you've got to put in your 10,000 hours. And so that product market fits typically the longest phase, then comes scale phase or replication, which then everything. And so when you, when I talk about it, I'm like, yeah, we became an overnight success that took me 15 years to achieve because we had to have that product market fit. Everyone from the outside says, Senhound started franchising in 2019. Look where they are now. They've totally exploded in one of the faster growing franchises in the world right now. Yeah, but they don't see the, the iceberg under the water. And that's another interesting point because all those years and decades that you put in before the overnight success hit, 
is what actually creates the moat around the business because yep. someone can replicate the nuts and bolts, the mechanics of a business, but they can't replicate the vision and the insights that the founder and the leadership team has on the market and on the problem. Yeah, and the entrepreneurial competency. So scale, a lot of people fail in the scale phase because the op that learned operational competency isn't there either. Like, how do you build high-performing teams? How do you connect people to a real culture and a real vision? Like, how do you align the organization so that everybody's rowing the same, in the same direction? How do you make sure you're climbing the ladder on the right wall versus the left wall? Like, how do you make sure you're doing all of these things? That takes that takes competency, which takes 10,000 hours to figure out. So let's jump into that and tell us a little bit about your journey evolving as a leader, as an entrepreneur, as a founder in everything from your mindset, your psychology, this evolution of becoming the kind of CEO who can build multiple high-performing teams, replicate that skill set. Yeah, I think it's really interesting that what I thought I was great at evolved into something which I know that I'm great at. And it's a narrowing. It's also a self-discovery process. Like know thyself is not easy, right? So I always thought I was a great operations person. And I was in management and operations careers before starting this operational, this entrepreneurial journey. And I ran operations in this product market fit for most of it. But as we started to get operations figured out and I started asking the right questions and really getting to know myself better and my why better, I started to really find out that I was a much better visionary. Like I really understood kind of pattern recognition and the ability to see where, what the probability streams going forward look like. And so that started narrowing as, okay, I'm good at operations, but there's people that are actually naturally better at it than me. But the visioning part, I'm actually exceptional at. And the other part that I started to really learn that I was good at, and maybe this is just the 10,000 hours, but hiring the right people and giving them an environment in which they can flourish, right? And so really constructing a container for the business to operate within that allows for people to become the best, the very best versions of themselves. So how do you get great people and how do you build a culture that nurtures A players and a great culture that injects all the viruses, the people that don't belong can self-select out. And what I by and large spend all of my time doing now is really managing that culture and that environment in which the people thrive and then constantly show, showing them or pointing to the North Star of where we're going so that we're all aligned to taking that hill together. And so that's been an evolution as I've learned myself and learned my skills. And there's a lot of letting go, right? So when it comes to, I see operational issues, I've got great people doing those things. Now, can I coach them or give them, ask them placed questions to get them to think about things? Absolutely. But it is not my job. I mean, I actually will screw things up or be in the way. So things accelerate when I actually understand exactly what my contribution is and do my contribution in the most powerful way and let the others do theirs and create an environment so they can actually be the best versions of themselves. And that's actually one of the secret sauces. And we haven't talked about this yet, but my wife and I built this business together. We are co-founders. And so there's some hard lessons in there about understanding and respecting each other's superpowers, what their special unique skills are, and then giving them the space and honoring their ability to do that without getting in the way. And we do that for each other. And that's actually one of the secret sauces to our success is her superpower has almost no overlap with my superpower. And so that's what makes us a really powerful couple is that she understands where I'm really great and she allows me to do that. And I understand where she's really great and I shut up when it's her turn. Are there any other principles you can pull out of that experience of building a business with your spouse? Because I know both of you, I've coached both of you, I've seen both of you. Not only have you built a remarkable business, and that's not just in terms of the metrics and the numbers, but a remarkable business in terms of a culture, in terms of a team, in terms of a, an atmosphere that, and I've worked with the leadership team as well, everyone really wants to be there. And there are actually people who are actively trying to break down your door to join the team, your team, because when they experience it, they immediately know in their body that this is a place that they want to be at because they can actually thrive. So not only have you built a remarkable business, 
but you've also been able to build a remarkable marriage, which has also lasted the test of time across several decades. And you've also been a remarkable parent to two boys and built a remarkable family. And that is a overlap of the Venn diagrams that very few people have an easy time achieving. So I'd love for you to speak to that. Certainly not an easy time achieving, but I would give all of the credit to Jessica because I think in my brain, I was like, let's go, let's build this thing. Let's focus on the mission in front of us. And Jessica has done an amazing job of reminding me and nurturing me that it's family first. That's the foundation to everything else. If we don't have a healthy marriage, if we're not aligned around what parenting looks like, and if we're not present for our kids, we can't build this tower on top of it. And so I was often off trying to build this where she kept bringing me back to remind me like, no, it's marriage first. And that really comes from obviously having trust and then the ability to have healthy conflict and really say the things so that things don't build up, having open channels. And it's actually... Jessica and my marriage that has made me a much better leader because be- learning those skills of open, authentic communication, healthy conflict, being able to work your way through ultimately being committed to a better outcome together, but going through what needs to go be gone through to get there is something that we've reflected in our business now. And so the business is really like this family where we have these team health meetings or these family meetings where we practice healthy conflict and we call each other out on things in a kind way, but make it a safe place for us to have that kind of conflict, which we've learned in our marriage format. And I think that's made me a much better entrepreneur. So I give all credit to Jessica for really making sure that family and relationship came first. That was the non-negotiable business was second and on top of that. And I don't know if it's the male brain. I don't know if it's just the way I was built, but I was very mission driven and didn't think that was important in the beginning. And it took me years to really get through lots of education from Jessica to get really aligned with that. That comes first, this comes second. And once I did, and once we, we really got good at those skills translated to everything in the business, because it's all the same thing. It's about interacting with people. It's about human psychology, which is exactly the business you're in, which is what makes that so powerful. It's a really great point you just made because I've been working with one of my clients where I help them uncover a fundamental conflict that's set up between their marriage and their business. Yeah. And I see this a lot, actually, where entrepreneurs have basically set up an adversarial relationship between the business and their primary relationship, marriage, their time with kids, their health, and other aspects that are actually super important. And I think it's, it's a really, really powerful shift to be clear, and I think this is a testament to the amount of work you've done on yourself in gaining self-awareness and getting to know yourself, to really understand clearly who you are and what your values are, what's important to you, and then rank things in your life in that way. And the beauty of that is the way you set it up, these aspects of your life are in conflict with each other. So the business isn't succeeding at the expense of your marriage. The business is succeeding because your marriage is succeeding. And our marriage is succeeding because of our business now, which is really cool because we're on this mission together, building something totally awesome that we're both totally passionate about, which just gives us all these overlaps where we're connected in so, in so many more meaningful ways. You go to work, your wife goes to work or whatever the dynamic is. And then you come home and you have your together time. We have an entirely another universe in our marriage where we're on this this mission together, we're taking this hill together, which we are having so much fun with. And because we've organized it in a way where we have our space and respect each other's skills and contribution so much that it just added it, right? So it adds to all of the excitement and the connection between us. And also it gives our two boys access to what a healthy relationship, a view to what a healthy relationship looks like view to what contribution looks like. And I believe contribution is the cure to all anxiety. So if you're actually doing something meaningful and you're delivering the gift of your skills to the world in some positive way, you feel good about yourselves. And to show that to our children, how we're actively engaged, we're contributing, we communicate well, we respect each other unconditionally. 
I think it's made our children better and give them visibility to what it looks like to be a, an active, healthy participant in society. Absolutely. And I think it's even being reflected in the older one's first romantic relationship. As Jessica was saying, the it's really incredible, the sweetness and the kindness and the, the modeling, the respect that yeah. that relationship exemplifies and how it's a reflection of what you guys have modeled for there. Yeah. Yeah. So we're very proud of our children when we're, and look, this is not an easy journey and it takes work and it has, you have to be intentional about it. None of this happens by default. And I certainly for the first years of a marriage just thought it would just take care of itself or I thought it doesn't need that much attention or none of those things are true. It needs intentionality. It needs work. It needs communication. Just like our culture is a very delicate thing, which is one of my primary jobs of maintaining that, our marriage is also a delicate thing that re requires attention, constant attention and working on to make sure that it stays healthy, vibrant, and strong. Let's talk about how you've evolved as a leader. You talked about letting go. You talked about encouraging healthy conflict. You talked about being proactive in communicating. What are other big shifts that you've had to go through to reach this level of leadership ability and capacity? Yeah, it, it, actually, I think one of the things that you taught me, which was really powerful, and it was just the metaphor you gave is I'm a tuning fork for my organization. I, I didn't quite have that language to it, but I already recognized that impact was happening. So protect your mindset is one of the things that I, you know, constantly giving my, my, my mantra around. So the morning routine whatever it is, and there's all kinds of biohacking and all the other kind of stuff that you can do out there. At the end of the day, do you show up at work balanced, open, positive energy, which shows everybody else how they should show up for work? When I started doing that, like de-risking how I show up to work every single day in a positive energy, open, authentic way every single day at work, the team starts, the world starts to form around you in that same way. And so that, that's actually one of the biggest evolutions is I'm upset about this or this isn't happening or that. That's actually tremendously counterproductive. And holding the paradox of not, things aren't right and also being in that tuning fork place where you're balanced and in a positive energy is a counterintuitive place to be because, hey, things aren't right over here. There's upset over here. I can understand that. I can hold, even hold accountability and coaching around that while holding my energy in a positive, balanced way. And that's what I think true leadership shows looks like. It's not what you say, it's who you are. So there's doing leadership and being leadership. And that's biggest evolution is how do I show up every day for my team? How do I show up in every interaction? Am I petty? Am I gossipy? Am I easy to anger? Am I inconsistent? Or am I consistent? positive, balanced, and coaching, right? Those are the places where I've been most effective as a leader. And that's been a huge evolution for me. Were there blind spots that you had before that were revealed? And then once those got revealed, it allowed a pretty big demonstrable shift or ability to scale the business. Absolutely. And there still are. And so that's the first thing I would say is this is an, a, a never ending process. But for me, there was a lot of stuff around fear, which I'm guessing is for a lot of people. Oh, fear, it's not going to work or fear that this part's going to fail or fear that I'm not going to look, I'm going to look stupid in this situation. And fear creates a tightness. It creates a reactivity. It creates an inconsistency. And so one of the big insights is get in touch with that. Like when you feel like you're starting to have negative thoughts or you're feeling at, out of alignment, ask the question. Again, good questions. I wonder why this is occurring. I wonder what's under that. Could it be fear? Could it be anxiety? Could it be you don't feel like you know, you're good enough or you don't have the skills or you made a mistake or what are these things? And then actually allow you to allow yourself to feel those feelings, experience them, and then start to ask the questions of what would it look like if and then you can start to work through those things, which then, and those are blind spots. So that's what you need. I think coaches like you are so great for, because I've, there's a bunch of times where I've tightened up and gone into fear without knowing it. And I thought I was problem solving, but I wasn't. I was reacting in a way that was fear-based or what anxiety-based or whatever, that you can then have that moment to pause, feel, 
process, recognize, and then start to ask the right questions. I think that's, I hope that was the right, hopefully that was a helpful answer. Yeah. I always say the business can only rise to the constraint of the entrepreneur and yeah. the bigger the business gets, it appears that it becomes even more important and monumental where the founder's energy is. And even the tiniest wobbles and shifts ripple across the entire business because yeah, the team becomes a reflection of the founder. Yeah, and I, as the organization gets bigger, it's important to understand the impact you have as a leader because I may have some underlying anxiety about something's not going right in this department. And I go ask that department, hey, what's going on with this? They're very tuned in to you. Like, uh, he's asking about this. Mm. Is there a problem? What's going on? Uh-oh. And then you, you, all of a sudden I spun up a tornado on something very unintentionally, but because I wasn't really clean with, okay, so pause, understand the dynamic, talk to the leader of that department, ask some of those questions. Maybe there's some coaching to happen there, but don't go out and talk to their department about it. Those are all kinds of like missteps I've made probably thousands of times through my entrepreneurial journey, but I'm getting better at and that really comes from really listening to yourself and being intentional about your communication, which I think is the other skill that I've really started to, started to get much better at is listening to that voice inside. So just last week, I made a decision about how we were going to do something. That night, it was just a voice. It was something just felt a little bit off. So I paused and I really reflected on it and I realized I had just gotten it wrong. So I went back to the leadership team. I said, look, I didn't, I left yesterday. I didn't feel good about this all night. Here's how I'm feeling about it. Here's why I think I'm feeling about it. What do you guys think? We were able to have a really healthy conflict around that issue and come to a better solution. And I think that made the team much stronger because I had the ability to listen to that voice inside of me and really get clean with myself so that I could move forward and be who I want to be and who I need to be every day as a leader. And I think just that demonstration of vulnerability and willingness to be wrong. Yeah. Is so profound in building trust. Yes. And that trust is a delicate thing. And I think as sometimes as leaders, we get so mission focused that we don't listen to that voice inside and, we, and it's invisible to us. We don't even know we're causing this damage. And that's where you need to be able to hear that voice inside and be in touch with that. What aspect of your personal transformation on this journey are you most proud of? That's a tough question because there's, there's been a pretty big evolution, but I think how I show up as a husband is probably what I'm most, most proud of. I think I show up as a husband in a very different way than I used to. And when I think about legacy, the first thing I go to on legacy is my children. Like when you think about legacy, people think about leaving plaques or buildings or that kind of stuff. What software do I leave with my kids, right? And that comes through a healthy marriage and a healthy relationship and being a balanced adult in front of them at all times. And I think how I've shown up for the marriage, and I really give Jessica almost all the credit for really bringing that front and center, and ultimately the legacy I'm leaving behind, which are my children and how they think about things. And so something that, I'm, that I was super proud of is my 50th birthday I recently had. And we, my wife did this whole book of people talking about what I meant to them. And my son, my oldest son, wrote a whole letter and it actually brought me to tears about how I gave him the gift of loving to learn. And that was like the most important thing to me. That's the legacy, part of the legacy I left with him, which is his passion and desire for learning. I think that's a powerful legacy to leave and I'm really proud of that. That's really beautiful. Yeah. And it, it says a lot about you, the, even the selection of the thing you're most proud of. Yeah. Thank you. So we, I think, began working together over a year ago. Yeah. And my mind can't even remember what things were like then. And it's been such a profound experience, I think, for both of us. How would you describe or articulate the impact of the work we've done. It spans so many areas and yeah. you know, so many ways. First of all, I have unlimited gratitude for you and your contribution to, to, to the organization, to me and to my family. It's been really profound. I think some of the things that have been most profound is I had this scarcity mindset still as we were growing, which you really helped me back up from and understand was fear. And it, there's nothing scarce out there. And it put me in a position to allow and to be captain of the unfolding that's happening before us, which has been really powerful. I think the other part, which has been just sheer joy and fun, 
is the ideation portion, the what's possible together to just have our brains come together and think through how things could be, what, the, what those probability streams look like, modeling that and playing with that. That's just a really fun place for me to be. And to have you at my side through a lot of that process has been really true joy. It's been such a fun experience for me as well. One of the things I would love for you to talk about is this idea of simultaneously leveling up. As we've attempted this beautiful, delicious, fun problem of exponentially scaling this business, what we've realized is that for you to exponentially scale, the entire layer underneath you, the leadership team has to exponentially scale as well. And then everyone underneath them. And we've been working through this really cool process because I've been able to work with you and I've been able to work with each person in the leadership team to create the transformation at each level of the fractal based on the design and vision that you have in your head. And that's been such a intellectually exquisite process. And I'd love for you to talk about that whole idea of simultaneously leveling up and why that's so critical for a business to scale at this pace. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because that is actually one of the pillars to, of your coaching with us is you having visibility of kind of the landscape of what's needed from each and every role and us to be able to talk about what are the skills, what are the butts, what seats, what are the right fits for each of those things and able to very precisely titrate the movement of each of those individuals to their next level, their next level of possibility, their next level of excellence. And so as we are going through this, we had a whole, we have a whole campaign going on. It's been for half a year now, of this simultaneously leveling up. And as we are got very clear on what accountabilities are needed by what role, which meant what skill sets were needed in each of those. Not everyone was fully at that space there. And so we needed to be able to have those, those honest, open conversations about what skill was needed there, but then also a format to help that individual realize the better version of themselves to be able to take on that role and learn those new skills in a safe way. Just like you're learning going from crawling to walking, you're going to fall down a whole bunch of times. It's okay. And yes, it is embarrassing when you're not perfect in front of other people. Let's get over that and let's actually go through the process and bias towards action of making that actually happen. And so what's been really great is it can't always come from me. And it needs these, and a lot of these leaders need a safe, confidential environment to be able to develop those things. And you've been able to, you've been able to give them access to that while understanding the entire container and where it's all going. What's something that you believe really strongly about entrepreneurship that very few people agree with you on? You know, I don't know if I can answer that. I think a lot of people may agree with me on some of these things. Yeah. I think entrepreneurialism is the way we are going to make the world better. I think it is one entrepreneur at a time trying to do good in the world or make the world a slightly better place through some kind of innovation or creation they're making. But that's one of my strong beliefs is that we ultimately all want to live in a great world. And entrepreneurial way, entrepreneurialism is a way for us to amplify our positive impact or our contribution to the world. And I think the more entrepreneurs that we can get on some kind of mission to make the world a slightly better place, I think that's what, I think that's what by and large people are seeking is they want to be a part of a mission that resonates with them, that they care about. So I feel strongly that entrepreneurs are going to lead the way for us to get there. We know that the political system isn't going to get us there in that same way. We need the political system, don't get me wrong, but I think entrepreneurialism is a really powerful force to affect change in the world and to rally people around a common cause and a common belief. If there's one truth that you wished every entrepreneur could know or remember, no, yeah, yeah. True. What would that be? It's just, it's, it might sound trite, but, and it's probably very common entrepreneurial advice, but it's also so true is that I was always looking for someone to tell me what to do, give me the formula. And it wasn't until I made the shift to bet on yourself. Like the answer is in you. The answer is not outside. Yes, there are best practices on certain things. But ultimately, it's just you're the person that you've got you've to put your money on. And if you're going to put your money on you, You've got, you better be working on developing that asset, evolving that asset, nurturing that asset, growing that asset, because that's the thing that's ultimately going to get you there. So 
bet on yourself and then spend the time developing yourself. That's a great mic drop moment and a <laughs> place for us to bring this beautiful conversation to a close. I'd love for you to share where people can find you. And if someone's interested in buying a scent town and running one so they can come into contact with dogs every day, how one might do that as well. Yeah. So you can check out scenthound.com or scenthoundfranchising.com and, or you can just email me at tim at scenthound.com. Reach out to me or connect with me on LinkedIn. Beautiful. Tim, thank you so much. We'll have all those thank links you. in the description. It's been such an honor, such a pleasure to be with you on the Sentown journey. And yeah, no, I appreciate you including the conversation. This was great. I really enjoyed this time. Beautiful. All right. Take care, Ronnie. See ya.